Welcome everyone to our patients current and past, to our families and friends, to our volunteers and co-workers. I want to welcome our entire Dartmouth Cancer Center community. This October represents the 50th anniversary of the Norris Cotton, now Dartmouth Cancer Center. That's 50 years of exceptional patient care and innovative family support provided to our community that spans two states from mountains to sea, rural to urban. So it's only fitting that today we highlight a complimentary care program that supports that diversity of patients. Patients who express themselves with brave vision, bold practice, and creative power. Our 12th annual Telling Our Story celebration highlights the creative work of our patients and their family members who have participated in the creative arts programs here at the Dartmouth Cancer Center as part of their journey through cancer. Creative arts at Dartmouth Health includes creative writing, visual art, and therapeutic harp, and is offered to all patients of our cancer center and throughout our medical center in partnership with the Dartmouth Health Arts and Humanities Program. Our creative arts and complementary care programs would not be possible without the generosity of donors, especially those that contribute to the annual Prouty event. We express thanks to everyone who contributed to tonight's event. First, thank you to Michelle Davis co for coordinating all of the details. And thank you, Marjorie and Kim, for mentoring the writers and the artists. And to our harpists, Margaret, Patty, and Pam, to all who have stepped forward with their stories, songs, poems, art, and a willingness to share your journey, you continue to inspire us. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And to all, I hope you enjoy this wonderful event. Hi, my name is Renee Flint. This is a poem I wrote called Cottonwood Leaf. I am surrounded by other paper-thin hearts, and I am upheld. Their support feels like soft, beautiful fabric, elegantly draped as fallen. We wait on the ground for the new season.
it's just a band-aid. It's just a band-aid, but I stare at it angrily. Why does it do this to me? It's four inches of cloth adhesive, but it packs a punch better than a right hook. I'm even more pissed because it's my second band-aid. In an effort to avoid emotional breakdown, I promptly ripped the prior one loose and trashed it. It hadn't even thunked into the soft plastic bag of the trash before the blood reappeared. Damn it. My hair has grown out, my port scar has faded into pale purple, but these strange, seemingly innocuous reminders of cancer send me into an uncomfortable level of fear and anxiety. Some nights, as I get ready for bed, I pause when I see the hooks nearby. They were hung to hold my chemo bag as I slept. I once had a fit of rage and tried to rip them out, but apparently the hook is connected to whatever's holding the house together. Someone asked me what advice I would give someone who's starting this process. I would tell them, let go of what you think you know about yourself. You're about to do things you didn't think you could do. Everything you thought you knew about yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, priorities, and passions, they're all about to be tested and forever altered. You will never, ever be the person that you were before. Whether you're still battling cancer or you're in remission, experiencing this changes you forever. Sometimes... It's your quiet reserve at the end of a fun trip when everyone is standing with their feet in the ocean talking about next time or when I come back and you just smile and nod because you probably don't have a next time or when you come back. But why spoil the moment? Why take away their innocence and hope just because you weren't given the same gift of blissful naivety brought on by a someday or the feeling of a possibility? Coming to home on my one bee swarm. Ever since I moved here from there, there has been clearing from my lenses, revealing my new home, not steadily, but like melting glaciers crashing into the North Sea. I thank one bee for a day when I gathered my tools to eliminate burdock from a patch near one of the creeks. I felt strong a part of things. I could tell weed from wanted. I could handle my tools a little. Insect repellent, hat, suntan goop, slicing and chopping tools, go! So hot and humid, how brave I was, how ready. Further and further out into the scratchy and sometimes dense, sometimes patchy grasses. I'm <laughs> pretty good at this. But the buzzing of the yellow jackets. I began to run up the hill. The yellow jackets followed after. I ran harder and harder until I fell yelling for help. And then all hot and bothered, I found my silly bone. In my hair, a single bumblebee, harmless and dead, alas. I got another more better dropping down right to here. In the shadow of the New York Women's House of Detention, 1964, my family lived in a fifth floor walk-up which overlooked West 10th Street and 6th Avenue, beyond which stood the New York Women's House of Detention. There was the world of our apartment and then the world at large, populated with pimps, boyfriends, girlfriends, and husbands on the sidewalk below the women caged in the prison. They yelled in, the women yelled out. These were private utterances of love and loss, which my ears could not unhear. The courthouse and prison formed an odd city block, roughly the shape of an obtuse triangle. This juncture on 6th Avenue was where 9th Street turned into Christopher Street, and a bit of pavement called the Ruth E. Wittenberg Triangle was located. Wittenberg, an advocate to demolish the prison and turn the open space into a community garden. Wittenberg advocated to demolish the prison and turn the open space into a community garden, which eventually did occur in the 70s. The proximity of my parents' apartment to the prison was the minutia of my daily life. 
The prison was an imposing 12-story building coated in soot, which overshadowed everything surrounding it. During the 60s, the city of New York incarcerated approximately 700 women, two women per four foot by eight foot cell. Collateral damage and slow death flowed from the prison every day. In 1964, I was seven, and my world was hardly circumspect. I was under no illusions about what lay outside our apartment, a population of caged women and a population of caged and nonconformist women. I would stare at the people yelling from the street and attempt to locate the small window from which wails of misery rang out. Sometimes sheets would be hung out of the windows, as though the inmate could shimmy down from eight stories above and simply jump to the pavement below. One of my oldest memories is a sweet canary with orange-dashed wings who lived in a cage in my bedroom. My mother opened the cage and the bird flew out the window towards the Jefferson Market, Market Clock Tower and then the New York Women's House of Detention. My mother had this shocked look at the speed at which the bird, at the speed of the bird's escape. I cried and cried, but this was among my earliest lessons. I do not know if this little bird landed on the sill of one of these bat barred prison windows, but I knew, do know that the little bird chose freedom. Foundation. I have not the beauty or the performance savvy of an Amanda Gorman, nor the gravitas of a Jane Kenyon, never mind her poet laureate husband, Donald Hall. In fact, the only other poet of note I can name is Maya Angelou. If I had to describe myself, the first thing I might say is short. The second is bakes good pie. These familiar words define me. But my tidy world was broken by your death. Now other words of great sorrow and oddly of great joy are streaming through the cracks. I have no way to manage the flow except to gather it into small bundles loosely called poems, stack them neatly between the pages, and try to build a new world with the tomes. Number one, the craft of writing. The craft of writing needs an empty space. On the silent page, one looks for opportunities to leave a trail of ink, making a path that meanders as time permits in loops and scribbles and curls. Feeling a kinship with the swoop of birds, old sibling buddies from the nest, as thunder rolls in the distance, knowing it may bring trauma, but staking one's life on the odds of a direct lightning strike, and with gut obstinacy continuing on, letting the sky decide whether to leave the wanderer wet or dry, or struck down to die. Table of Experiences kind of like putting your biography and obituary on a table. The good times, the not so good times, the friends we've made, the friends we've lost, births and deaths of family, feelings of joy and wonder, sadness of divorces, happiness of a positive and loving second marriage, getting better from a rare neuro disorder, learning to deal with your body as it starts to age, looking back on 40 years of working at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, gratitude, lots of that, 
for all the dogs that blessed our growing up and kept us walking. Sparky, Blaze, Flame, Trevor, Maverick, Ivy, and Winslow. For parents who helped in so many ways. For teachers who challenged me along the way but believed in me. For medical staff in North Carolina, Vermont, and New Hampshire. It's a very old table, but it stood the test of time. I'm grateful for all the items on my table. Touch the small rough crystal, form a prayer, release the noise, silence, unwanted chatter, acknowledge imperfection, let go expectations, build your best life, consider everything, develop beginner's mind, inhabit your dreams, accept today's gifts. Hold the joy of a shared smile. Seek cool shadows. Sit at the stream's edge. Embrace water, rock, tree. Walk in the mossy woods. Listen to the simplicity of balance. Give thanks and praise. Something solid. Find anything, something solid to hold the burden. Transfer it, please, the messy weight of it all, a degree of suffering. I need a thing to support me unconditionally, not a partner, a friend, mother, or daughter. They have conditions. Let it go. Do not hold it yourself. It may be too much to bear. Physically stressing your bones, muscles, and brain. Mentally taxing your mind. Spiritually dampening your fire. Please lift me, empower me, and enlighten me. Something solid melts into liquid, beginning to flow. Now I can appreciate the joy, and I am grateful. All water has perfect memory. How amazing the small, the smell of wet moss and rotting wood in the moldy leaves in the spring. The call of the robin high in the tree, red breast in the sunlight. How many springs have I felt the resurgence of life wafting up from the ground to my nose or heard the bird call in my ears. And yet even though it is memory, it is new again. The old drifts out of my hand as if I were asleep, like an old person in rocking chair. The new awakens me, then there is the light of the sun on the water and the breeze that brings me home to me. So, is that what memory is? My senses bring home things I've seen and felt before, and each time it is anew. Did I always stop when I saw light on moving water? Or is it just now that this beautiful impermanence catches my breath and reminds me, don't miss this, pay attention. Did I stop at the top of the bridge and kneel in awe at the beauty? Redundant. A cartographer stands in a small town, tallies purchases, orders shelves, takes inventory, longs for his old work life, tools, purposefulness. He no longer guides with carefully detailed maps. He fuels travelers and their vehicles, troubleshoots the pumps, 
clears snow. Truckers appreciate his precision with the scan wand, knowledge of codes, assistance, balancing their load. Patiently, he guides a young camper's purchase. She inhales wide-eyed, slides her card. The machine insists on a pin number. She flushes, removes the plastic. He clears the machine and nods. Push credit, push accept, sign the screen. Triumphant, she hands slushies to her friends. He muses to his next customer, were we ever that young? Hello, my name is Margo Marone, and I've been part of the writing circle for many years. I am 10 years out from my cancer. One poem I wrote, very simple, uh, after watching a beautiful sunset. Clear skies are ideal, or are they? It is the clouds that reveal the beauty. In the sky, and in life too. And then I wrote another one. Such beauty surrounds me. In summer, the birds call it out. See the flowers, hovering bees that pollinate, clouds dancing across the sky, the smell of rain watering the earth, sparkling lakes that invite me in, the rush of coolness tingles my skin. So much for which to be grateful. Yet there is sadness and nobody with whom to share it. Thank you. Change in the weather. I just finished 44 days of low dose radiation at DHMC. I saw the same people at the same time every day for nine weeks. Mary at the door asking if I had any COVID symptoms. Dan, the security guard who helped folks who needed help getting in. Diane, the receptionist in area 2K. The radiation techs varied a little bit, but they were from the same group of six or eight folks. Dr. Zaki and Patsy every Thursday at check-in. The change is that I don't need to go in now I kind of miss my old hospital family.
Hi, I'm Michelle Davis, Program Specialist for the Complementary Care Program, and I'd like to read for you a poem I wrote called In My Garden. Inchworm, inchworm, measuring the miracles. Seems to me you'd stop and see how beautiful they are. That was how my four-year-old self heard this song, and I was awestruck that this tiny, fragile creature not only understood what a miracle was, but also had the ability to measure one. It was magical. And being just four, I had only a vague idea of what a miracle was. So every time I saw an inchworm on a leaf or a flower or in my hair, I felt enchanted, like I was seeing something no one else knew about. And those leaves and flowers and everything the inchworm touched must be the miracles the song mentioned. That included me and my sister and definitely my mama. At some point, I learned the actual words, miracles. But the deep knowing of the miraculous beauty of nature is something I never outgrew. Happy bees, hopping frogs, nesting wrens, darting dragonflies, clever squirrels, delicate spider webs covered in dew, song and birch leaves caught on a breeze, the smile of sunflowers, a spotted fawn. And I think of this song when I'm in my big girl garden, quietly admiring the flowers and fruits that I have to grow with gentle dirt covered hands at one with the buzzes and breezes, the sweet and savory smells, the graceful butterflies, the warm earth beneath my feet, the sunshine on my skin, and all of the curious creatures who come to visit. Sun, rain, earth, seeds, pollinators, worms who can calculate. Nature creating miracles right here in my garden. I breathe it all in and hope one day the world will stop and see how beautiful we are. Thank you. In the Middle Spring Up not too high in the middle spring, bound tight to my branch, tightly rightly seating as in a saddle. Small me rode the breezes on my cherry bark horse, barely hidden in the new blooms, my calf, my elbow, my cheek. Every dream spread through me, powerful but soft, in the safe embrace of the motion of high clouds. Just before the flocks happens, it, me. Always in my tree, whose precious parchment bark as the flavor of earth in the middle spring. Homesick in heaven. I lay on the floor with you. It's killing my back, but feeding my soul. The weather today is perfect, and the breeze lightly trails in through the sliding glass door. From where we lay, I can stare out the open door and watch the sunlight play on the tops of full green leaves. The air flowing into the room smells like fresh cut brass in summertime as it swirls through the light curtains, fluttering them just enough to brush against our heads, making you laugh. Is that where God is today? You ask, turning your face just enough for your whisper to reverberate and tickle my ear. You can see God anywhere, really, I answered. We talk about God a lot when it comes to weather. You've always been an early riser, and we would come to this very window when we would first wake up in the mornings and watch the pink rise and spread through the sky. And whenever the pinkish-orange tinge seemed most brilliant, I would whisper to you, it's like seeing God. And as most toddlers do, you started saying it back to me. Your little hand reaches out and grabs mine, scooting your body down so you can reach it, and leaning in to lay your head on my belly. It hurts. I've had so many surgeries and procedures done to this area, but I wouldn't dream of moving you. Can we go play sharks now? Just one more minute, I beg. See? 
You're just four, and you don't know that we're running out of time. You don't know that in the blink of an eye, probably soon enough that you'll barely even remember me, I'll be gone. And I really hope that when I'm fluttering in the sunlight and the birch leaves, or shining in the pink-orange sunrise, that you'll feel my warmth and you'll channel even an ounce of the peace and happiness I feel laying on the floor with you. Knowing that it's the best place I've ever been with the most amazing person I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Maybe it'll get locked away deep inside you so that even if you don't remember this, you'll look out at the scene in moments of stress and feel a calmness or an ease. Maybe you'll feel at peace, like a peace washes over you and you won't understand it at all, but it'll be me. And I don't know what comes next, and I don't know where we go when we die, and I don't know if there's any way at all that I can make my way back to you. But if there is, I'll be in that place, watching you grow and watching you become you. And no matter how pearly the gates, how golden the streets, or how beautiful the company might be, I might be the only one in, who is homesick in heaven. You cannot put a fire out. What ignites like fire and burns like fire keeps going like fire is life churning through the veins and capillaries mysteriously surging from head to toe and steadily breathing to calm. Hearts beating has been the sign and signal of life and love and it is so much more than that. It is the tiniest calcium channel in the cell that magically opens because it gains access to the key, another hydrogen or, or another cell or oxygen. And that opening allows the transferring of the substance to feed the cell, to encourage the heart. And all this is happening under the surface, beneath the skin as we walk buoyant in the sea of sunshine breathing the fresh air, marveling at the day, and inside the magic goes on. The Last Days of Chemo In the last days of my chemo treatment, during the mid-December days of holiday anticipation, and after a few months of outpatient chemo, which had left me a bit wilted, it came time to retreat for three weeks to a climate-controlled room as an inpatient, so I could surrender my immune system to the cause of beating cancer. And so for the first week, as signs of holiday cheer began to appear at the nurse's station, it was a chemo infusion one day, then a day off, then a different chemo infusion the next day, then a day off, and so forth, till I had hardly a white blood cell left to my name. The first day's medication was the harshest, though. At 10 p.m. the infusion began of a little compound called carmustine. I was quite accustomed to nurses coming into my room at all hours with various tasks to keep me alive, and happy to see a human face, I'd climb to my feet and step on the scale and back into bed for whatever shots were due. But on this night, with Carmustine at work, I tried to stand up, swooned, and fell back into bed, not sure if the murky figure standing at my bedside was a nurse, or was really, instead, the ghost of Christmas past. And this is a poem I wrote called Hide. There is quiet stillness and a roaring silence as the walls go up. Undesirable, but seemingly inevitable, a needed relief and refuge when the walls go up. It's like hearing the ticking of a clock downstairs when sleep will not come. It's both a comfort and a hindrance. Is it resignation or acceptance, a giving over or a breaking open when the walls go up? Are those closest to her able to see the gradual fade away, the slow disappearance of light as the walls go up?
Uncle, you went down off your horse at death. But hey, I never found out if you were as surprised as I was. I counted on your point of view, not those nails on the barn floor. I counted on you looking out for me sometimes. And now sometimes I kiss the emptiness where you no longer sit and wait expectant at the gate where I used to wait for everything. Hey, hey, I got the fence done, but I can't stop waiting for you. Breathe out. I cannot help but think, as I open the windows to the day, and the cool morning air flows in, crisp and moist, of how from your failing body your last warm breath ran out. The window was open then, too. We could hear the spring bird song, the distant hum of a small plane overhead, the buzz of a chainsaw somewhere in the distance. The April breeze flowed into the room. Though you were past speech, you must have felt it, smelled it. Your heart leapt at the possibilities, and you were gone. Waited. The weight of my granddaughter in my arms. I am mindful as her little body shifts towards mine. I vaguely recall my daughter's doing the same, an altered perspective. I experienced happiness and joy in them, but time moved faster, I swear. Dishes to wash, diapers to change, laundry to fold, career to have, love to make, myself to give. What's next? Always anticipating. I flew, flitted, flustered and frustrated. Now I am grounded by the weight, grateful. Time slows, I swear. I zoom out, watching and witnessing. I zoom in, touching, sensing. Myself to love, with more to give, weighted with pure joy. I R. Whenever I go walking now, it is not unusual for a neighbor to cease weeding or raking, to lean on the fence or perch on the stone wall and ask with concern furrowing their brow, how are you? I don't want to dump on them the gritty details of my broken heart. But being kind people and neighbors who have shared this town for 30 years, they have asked a vital question. Now they wait, fidgeting, anxious. How will I answer? How are you? I generally say, a bit ruefully, with a shrug and the ghost of a smile, I are. This makes them laugh. The awkwardness passes. Now we can talk about small things instead. Stacking wood. Still not done. Dogs. Mine straining at her leash. The country store. Will it fold? Cell phone reception. Lousy. <laughs> After a bit... Our respective tasks call us back to life, them to weeding or raking, me to walking the straining dog and stacking the waiting wood. Ordinary and extraordinary. The bok choy in the willing hand's garden was full of life and ready to feed a family in need today. It's early in the growing season, but it was in mid-season form.
filled with the gladness of living. One can only really experience the gladness of living if they've known the badness of dying. I wonder if everyone thinks the way that I do. I wonder if even I always thought the way that I do. Who picks up beautiful things and looks for the cracks in it? Who inspects these treasures intent on finding the flaw that then makes them truly worthy of being called beautiful? I used to look at broken things and try to find beauty. Now I look at beautiful things and I try to find the breaks. Before I had cancer, I loved my hair. I had long, beautiful hair that flowed like golden waves down my back. I spent hours doing my hair, hours upon hours, days upon days, and then it was gone. Before I had cancer, I loved my job. I would wake up in the morning and sip my coffee on the way in. I would be greeted at the door by eager coworkers, and we would tackle the day at 100 miles per hour. And then I couldn't go there for a while. Before I had cancer, I enjoyed spending time with my son. I would read him bedtime stories and tuck him in and think, wow, what a great kid. And then I was too sick to read every night. And now, now that I've been through that hell, now that my soul has been crushed and I've clawed my way out of the depths of darkness that I was thrown into, now I am filled with the gladness of living. Now I love my hair. It's short. It's not what I ever wanted it to be, but I love it anyway. I put it in these ridiculously small and strange ponytails and I delight over it. <clears throat> because I know what it's like to not have it. Now I slow down at work. I triage, I make slower but sounder decisions, and I invest in the people alongside me. How are you doing? I ask them while we're in the middle of a situation. Are you doing okay? Because now I know why I actually loved it to begin with. Now when my son pretends to have to pee again or asks for another glass of water and he takes 20 minutes to pick a book, and it's the same book we've read 13 times already this week. I don't rush him, and I do the voices just as well the 14th time as I did the first. Because I know that there's literally nowhere in the world, or beyond, that beats sitting and reading him this book while he avoids his bedtime. Because once you know the badness of dying, you are full of the gladness of living. Kindness Meditation May your feet know the joy of a snowy path. May your hands turn to work for others. May your eyes find hope in the starry sky. May your mind rest from distraction. May your smile radiate without warning. May your shoulders put down their burdens. May your soul know connection with others. May your spirit be renewed in nature. May your heart radiate love with every beat.